this is more like an elegy on her childhood the house doesn't matter grandmother doesn't matter this whole thing matters because of what that thing meant to her hello and welcome back to nibble pop today we are going to look at one of my very favorite poems my grandmother's house by kamala das it was some 2 years back that i had made a video lecture on another poem by kamala das an introduction many of you have already watched that and this video is a much requested video so i hope you will enjoy today's class and feel free to comment about anything that comes to your mind i'm going to look at each and every line of this poem analyze it bring out the meanings of the images the visual the auditory sensations that we have and finally see how this poem is a confessional poem and how this poem is uh, another expression of her continued trend of feminist writing so while we are at it why don't you click that subscribe button and turn on the notification so that you get updated every time a new video comes up this is mona mi mukaji welcome once again for those of you who have not watched the previous video uh, on introduction that poem by kamala das i'm just giving you a very brief outline of kamala das's life and the kind of writer she was it was on 31st march 1934 that kamala das was born she was born in south india in malabar and she grew up mostly in her grandmother's house she got married at a very early age to a man who was quite older to her and faced a lot of crisis so far as her emotions were concerned she was a very sensitive person because while she was growing up uh, she was within this cocoon of literature because her mother she was a very renowned poet herself her uncle he was also a very renowned poet and uh, her father he was an editor of a newspaper so she grew up within a culture where literature where language these things were promoted and developed and her linguistic skills enabled her to not just write in her mother tongue that is malayalam uh, but also in english in most of her writings like in all of her writings we have this intense personal outpouring of emotions and she questions different problems that a woman faces in society uh, if you look at the timeline of her life like when she was growing up uh, and she reached adulthood it was the time when india got her freedom but she found that this freedom was not without its failings this freedom was probably only for the male citizens of india the women were not free at all so this disparity this difference in status between men and women in a free country is something that disturbed her something that destabilized her and when you look at her autobiography my story that was published in the 70s you would see how this destabilization is accepted by her she is not running away from herself she is confessing herself in this poem which we are going to look at today she talks about her childhood about her grandmother's house and although the word grandmother may mean two things uh, one is your mother's mother and one is your father's mother here it specifically refers to her mother's mother okay this is interesting because when she's talking about her mother's mother and not her father's mother she is trying to draw a matrilineal lineage or a line where her story 
is a reflection of the story of her female predecessors or female foremothers. So she is hitting at the concept of forefathers and she is showing how she can bring out the history of mothers through this unique line created. Okay, so when we will look at the poem, first we will try to uh, see the literal meaning of the poem, the lines, and then we'll try to dig a little deep and see what else unearths. There is a house now far away where once I received love. You will notice that when we read this line or this part, we don't stop at the end of the first line, but we kind of roll over to the second line, right? So this strategy, this poetic strategy is called an enjambment, where a line kind of rolls on to the next line, it kind of makes a continuity. So this breaks any idea of rhyme and makes it more prose like okay so then she uses uh, some dots ellipses we will come to that these poetic devices later let's just read on she's talking about a house where she was loved that woman died so she received love from her grandmother and now that she's writing this poem her grandmother had already died and then she describes what happened to the house after her grandmother died. The house withdrew into silence. Snakes moved among books. I was then too young to read and my blood turned cold like the moon. How often I think of going there. She is not allowing us to stop. She is going on talking and this flow comes from the emotion you associate with nostalgia. What is nostalgia? When you think about the past and you think about the past as if the past was a good thing and now you want to go back there. We have these uh, kinds of uh, undercurrents in romantic poetry. So we can say there's a kind of a romanticism uh, which we find here and a kind of an idealization of the past and why is this idealization done because that past was the time when she felt free when she was loved it was the time when India was not free yet ironically so now the house has withdrawn into silence so everything about the house has become quiet now because her grandmother was the sole a resident of that house and now that she is not there anymore the house is silent snakes moved among books now this line has has been misinterpreted i guess or i think it is uh, not interpreted uh, to its full potential when i looked up the kind of interpretations that were available online offline i saw that this line means that the house was deserted and snakes crawled in and it was a dangerous place now. Uh, it was no more a place offering safety. But when I started to think about these lines and I looked up a few details about her grandmother, I found that it was possible that in that house, in her grandmother's house, there were journals and diaries uh, written by her mother and possibly her grandmother too. Because if her grandmother was not keeping any journal, not keeping any diaries, uh, at least her mother did. Okay. So when I look at the expression, the snakes crawling in moved among books and then she writes, I was then too young to read. So what books? are referred to here. Maybe she is talking about the books or the journals written down, notebooks written uh, on by her grandmother, her mother and snakes mean not actual snakes but the curvy handwritings, the cursive writings. So to her eyes those 
writings on those journals were like these snakes. Why I am talking about uh, this phrase in this way is not, not just because I am imagining things, but she had in other poems talked about snake as an image uh, which coincides with secrecy and secrecy is something you associate with diary writing. Women's writing uh, which comes out when you have these kinds of confessional modes has always been suppressed. Women even now it's very rare that a woman really manages to write everything about herself in the true sense with complete honesty uh, because there are inhibitions, inhibitions which men do not have to face. Okay, So snakes moving among books is perhaps an indication of the secret writings of her mother's or grandmother's journals. In this context, I want you to look at another poem written by her, it's called Blood uh, and I'm just reading just a little bit from there uh, just to explain to you what this snake thing is. In that poem, she talks about her childhood, her um, brother and herself, they used to play at their grandmother's house and the grandmother she was very sad because she would die soon and what would happen to this house and while talking about those things the grandmother was telling them about I'm just quoting from there you see this house of ours now 300 years of old it's falling to little bits before our very eyes so the grandmother was talking about that house uh, almost breaking apart the walls are cracked and torn and moistened by the rains and then after a while she talks about the rats come out of the holes and scamper past our doors the snake shrine is dark with weeds and all the snake gods in the shrine have lichen on their hoods oh it hurts me she cried so this snake shrine is very important there was an actual snake shrine right outside her grandmother's house in that Nalapath property and from this perspective snakes don't correspond to the idea of devil, the idea of darkness but the idea of divinity, okay. the idea of uh, the other world. It's as if when the snakes creep inside the house they are claiming this house as their own and this means the grandmother's soul has reached that other world, the world of the snakes, the world of the divine. We can also see it in that way. So don't look at this image of snakes uh, from any negative perspective uh, yet because uh, in Kamaladas we have all different kinds of metaphors involving snakes. Sometimes uh, they are filled with venom and then that is a negative image and sometimes they are moving among books and then we don't see any danger in them but only coldness. Snakes represent a kind of coldness and when you write down things about even your emotions that writing is cold. Okay, so books uh, here represent uh, wisdom, experience, the journal of our uh, four mothers and at the same time it represents the past which she cannot reach anymore all right okay then snakes moved among books i was then too young to read then means when her grandmother had died i was then too young to read this proves my point on two levels one is of course when her grandmother died she was not that young that she couldn't read then this is not actual reading that she is talking about. She was too young to read means she was too young to understand what was written in those books, to understand the kind of suffering she had underwent written on those books. So there are multiple ways you can interpret this. And my blood turned cold like the moon. Usually we associate moon with beauty with light we fail to realize that the moon is basically a very cold place it's a bare place 
it doesn't have any color and it has a lot of black spots. Kamala Das felt that her blood was turning like the moon. Usually your blood is red. So when your blood is turning into something like the moon, it means you are becoming pale, you are losing blood. This shows that the death of her grandmother was kind of a very strong emotional shock for her. She could not go on like before. It really transformed her. Then she comes to her feelings that are happening now. How often I think of going there to peer through blind eyes of windows or just listen to the frozen air. She wants to go back, visit that place to look inside the house. The windows have blinds. Okay, blinds are like these screens you put on windows through which you can peep. The other meaning of blind is a person who cannot see. So here the house is kind of personified as if the house cannot see too. It is the house is blinded and the air is frozen. So this house which has once been a center of warmth for her where she received all that love has now become a symbol of death, of silence, of loneliness, of coldness and yet she wants to go there. Why? Or in wild despair, pick an arm full of darkness to bring it here to lie behind my bedroom door like a brooding dog. She wants to go there, scoop up some darkness as if that darkness was a puppy, a little dog and carry it in your arms, bring it back to your house, keep it near your bedroom door. She is turning a sensation into a concrete object and this is her imagination. And look at the very peculiar combination of ideas here. She is trying to pick an armful of darkness. Usually uh, you don't associate darkness with a baby or something which you can love. But that darkness which belongs to her grandmother's house is preferable to her when she compares it to the apparent life and light of her present marital condition. So her present life is worse than that death house. And when she is talking about bringing that darkness like a dog, what does a dog represent? A dog represents two things. One is loyalty and one is, well, protection. So that dog of darkness, that dog of memory, which is going to keep outside her bedroom, is going to protect her, shield her from the real darkness of her present life, which is darker than the grandmother's house where snakes are crawling. And why bedroom door? Why not kitchen? Why not living room? Why not foyer area? Why bedroom door? Because bedroom representing intimacy, marital bliss. This has failed to give her the kind of comfort, the kind of security which people expect from marriage. So in order to counter that sense of insecurity, that sense of, you know, that lack of satisfaction, that lack of communion with her partner, in order to counteract that, she needs that darkness of dog or dog of darkness outside her bedroom door. You cannot believe darling, can you? Who is this darling? Her husband? Her lover? We? We don't know. When she writes uh, confessional poems, she is often addressing us. You cannot believe darling, can you? That I lived in such a house and was proud and loved. Why does she question this? Uh, why should we question that, oh, you lived in that house, how could you live in that house and be happy? Because that house, when she is writing this poem, has become such a broken mess that uh, it's not possible for us to realize that this house was once very beautiful. So she is saying that, please believe that although this house is in ruins now, I used to feel happy there. 
I again before that I you have three dots I who have lost my way and beg now at strangers doors to receive love at least in small change she has lost her way when you talk about childhood you people are young adults now even you have a feeling that now you are burdened with so much of responsibilities uh, when you were class in class 5 6 uh, life was easier wasn't it so imagine what you would feel when you would turn 30 40 and imagine how you would feel if the person you're living with does not reciprocate what you expect or doesn't have an emotional connection with you. Then nostalgia becomes a defense mechanism. It becomes the only way to somehow manage to survive thinking about the past. She has now come to the stage where uh, she is now begging at strangers' doors. Her grandmother, her mother, people who loved her at that house, they were related to her. But now she doesn't have access to these people. And all she can manage is look for distractions. She has written about these multiple affairs with men and women in her uh, My Story, the autobiography she wrote. But it is not just sexual love we are talking about. This is recognition, appreciation, feeling of comfort when somebody appreciates you, loves you. It doesn't always have to be a physical relationship, a sexual relationship. But she has to now go to strangers' doors to receive love. And in exchange of what? Small change. Like maybe she has to get love not as a lifelong commitment. Nobody offers her a whole lifetime of love. They offer her maybe a weekend of love. It's like a small change. And this final expression, small change, is an expression of economics. It's a monetary, uh, you can say, a monetary symbol or image. So while that grandmother's house is a site of emotions, her present life is a site of economical or economic exchange where everybody judges her based on profit, loss, how much she has to offer, how much they will get back. So the selfless love which she received at her grandmother's place without having to spend or invest anything, here she is having a life where she knows that the kind of love she is receiving on a small scale level, on a short duration, temporary level, this is all bought. This is not genuine, but she has no other alternative. So this is basically a poem about her childhood. The subject of this poem is her grandmother's house, but the real subject of her poem is her own childhood and a contrast between that time and her present despair, the loveless life that she is having now. Now let's look at some of the technical issues in the poem, the poetic devices as I was talking about ellipses first. She uses ellipses three times, first is in the second line, I received love dot dot dot. And then uh, later on, she is talking about brooding dog, again three dots. And at last when she says, and loved, three dots, I who have lost. So how do these uh, ellipses, these are, these are dots are called ellipses, how do they contribute to the poem? They are, just like Emily Dickinson uses dashes, a lot of dash here and there. These are making you stop and at the same time it's interiorizing the whole poem. It's as if she is breaking down layer after layer of her psyche and getting inside herself. You know, I receive love and then she stops because she is thinking about 
when was the time when she stopped receiving love and then she says that woman died then when she's talking about the dog before that there was a huge flow of emotion and then she feels that nobody is going to believe that i'm so emotional about the place so she stops she's coming out so she is just moving places inside her psyche and then she says you won't believe that i feel like this for that house finally she makes that final transition to her real present self looks at herself from outside and sees that i am begging at stranger stores now so the use of ellipsis offers a kind of continuity and at the same time a break a pause where she allows herself a little shift in tone all right i have also mentioned the word enjambment so i'm not repeating myself just notice that it's only once or twice that she allows us to stop at the end of a line we are always going along with her statement to the next line and to the next line as if she is not allowing herself to stop because when you start thinking about your past your memories they come flooding down you cannot check them you cannot rhyme them and there is no rhythm even no consistent rhythm at least you should be very attentive to the various ways in which non living objects or uh, non human objects or animals they are used in this poem uh, we have that snake uh, metaphor and when you talk about the snake metaphor please mention the snake shrine outside her house so that you can provide the examiner with an insight that snakes don't always represent death and desolation and darkness it also represents the afterlife and somehow snakes are not repulsive creatures here okay and if you are bold enough do mention uh, or refer to that idea of snakes among the books as the handwritings of secretive diary writers okay uh, then Uh, look at uh, the expression blind eyes of windows windows inanimate objects they don't have eyes like the windows are the eyes of the house uh, taken metaphorically and since windows have blinds windows can't see here the air is frozen freezing is uh, well it's about death it is coinciding with the idea of absence of life and frozen not just uh, on a natural physical level but also on an emotional level that house is cold for her now because that house was her grandmother's house now it's not her grandmother's house anymore the grandmother is not there we have this dog which is not a dog uh, darkness and memory all combined into Uh, a very loving figure of a faithful dog waiting to secure you to protect you so all these playing with images symbols why is this necessary you see when a person is confessing something this is a confessional mode right when a person is confessing something then we expect them to be direct and honest that okay you have decided to confess so now go on tell us what you have done but it's not always that easy you have to make use of images metaphors roundabout way of talking even when you want to tell people about what you have done especially or probably only if you are a woman now talking about this uh, confessional poetry confessionalism it began in the united states in and around 1950s uh, we have uh, writers like robert lovell sylvia plath and then annie sexton uh, they rebelled against conservative writing 
and talked about intensely personal emotions, experiences, uh, topics which were taboo, you know, female sexuality, mental illness, uh, all these things. So, Kamala Das, when she was uh, starting with her confessional mode, she was also doing the same thing. She was talking about things which, uh, forget about Indian women, even uh, women in uh, United States, they were not uh, comfortable asking. Historically, uh, she was part of the second wave of feminism generation, that, that bold phase when women were talking of uh, no, they were not talking of inclusion anymore. Uh, I had made this video on feminism, uh, the theory of feminism. I strongly advise you to watch that video to understand the different waves, the different stages of feminism and how different stages brought out different kinds of questions and brought out different ways of resolving them. So what kind of a poem is this? It is a confessional poem. She is confessing at the end of the poem that she is moving around at strangers' doors to receive love. And at the same time, is it not an elegy? Elegy is a poem you write on death, somebody's death, her grandmother's death. But it's not technically an elegy on her grandmother. This is more like an elegy on her childhood. The house doesn't matter, grandmother doesn't matter. This whole thing matters because of what that thing meant to her. So this is a very personal, uh, emotional poem where she is the central figure. She is the subject. The love she received and the love she stopped to receive. So subject in any subjective poem is the poet. No matter what the title is, no matter what this apparently looks like, this poem is about Kamala Das, not about her grandmother's house. It is about what the grandmother's house meant to her and what its loss, what its ruins mean to her now. I don't know if you have that poem and introduction in your syllabus. If you have that, uh, you definitely should watch the video that I had made. If you don't have that poem, even then, it won't take much of your time. Go and watch that video. You don't have to read pages and pages of notes. You just have to hear through your headphones, right? So go and watch that other video I had made and that video on feminism. Because I believe strongly that you can come up with something else which I have missed. Because subjective poem is beautiful because it doesn't give any objective meaning. This poem generates meaning through its reader. I am looking at this poem and while I'm looking at this poem, I am an Indian woman. I don't know what you are, but you are definitely not me. So I'm definitely sure that you will have a different set of meanings when you look at this poem too. Please share those ideas with me, those interpretations with me, because poetry is something which gives you freedom. Analysis is something that should give you freedom. I would love to hear weirdest of ideas about what you think about these expressions and how you think some of my expressions or some of my interpretations don't match with yours. Reading Kamala Das with you has been really a wonderful experience and it was just like two years back. I'm kind of moving back in time here it seems. I will be taking up more of her poems in due course of time. I'm planning to uh, do a couple of more poems by other feminist writers, uh, maybe uh, something from Emily Dickinson, next video. Till then, I want you to start reading because now the semesters have started. I wish you all the best for the upcoming session. So till our next video, stay happy, stay subscribed. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off. 
Bye-bye. Thank you.